welcome to June Millington and Friends, a podcast about music, why we do it, how we do it, the magical and spiritual aspects of writing and reaching deep inside ourselves. So dive deep with us. It's sponsored by the Institute for the Musical Arts. And if you'd like to support our efforts, please go to www.ima.org and click on any donate button. Thank you. So, Aidy, it is May 24th, 2020. Yeah. How did we do this? One step at a time. (laughs) Definitely one step at a time. Seriously. So I want to go back. Do you remember when we met, what the circumstances were? I think it was Holly Near's Fire in the Rain album. Right. Did we meet... Up in Ukiah, or did we meet in San Francisco? You were living in San Francisco, right? Right. And I had set this qualification for Holly for her album, Fire in the Rain. I do remember this. I said, you know what? I would be happy to be considered as your producer for this album. However, I will not work with your best friends or somebody you met who you felt like played really good that one time you all jammed, or <laughs> that kind of thing. And I said, but I'm certainly happy to audition whomever you'd like to bring my way. And I think you were the first, uh. maybe the only who passed the audition. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really sure. But what do, you, what do you remember about those early days? So that was Fire in the Rain. It was the 70s, late 70s, or maybe 80? It was 1980. Okay. What I remember is being in awe of the fact that all of this was happening and that I was actually there to witness it. Never mind be a part of it. It was the first album project I'd worked on. Everything to me was fascinating. It was learning every minute. Every minute I was learning and having fun and doing what I came into the world to do. Mm -hmm. Um, It was probably the first moment in my life where I was fully immersed in my reason for being, Mm. which is to sit at the piano, to make music with people, and to learn. And I was learning from you immensely. I was learning from Holly. I was learning from Mary Watkins, learning from Mm -hmm. Leslie Ann Jones, Mm -hmm. right? Things that to this day stick with me. Mm -hmm. Um, But really what I recall most of all was the thrill of being a part of this really interesting creative process that was unpredictable, that was collaborative, that really was rooted in the shared genius of you and Holly, and the spirit of absolute joy that we were doing this together. And we did it twice, as I recall. We did a practice run of the whole thing, yeah. uh, the upstairs small studio at the Automat, right. which was something that I totally insisted on in those days, because I knew, number one, it would get the jitters out. And also, we could check on the keys, the final arrangements get a chance to hang out together, to to play together and work together. You were a great student. Well, thank you. You really were. It was such a pleasure to lay out a chart in front of you and have you understand the concept of, number one, why we were doing it that way, and number two, you could read it. Yeah, that was not a given, was it? No, not at all. I mean, it's still not a given. You know, chart writing and chart reading is actually especially now a very specialized subgenre of skills or a skill. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But you had assembled an ensemble of people who all spoke those languages, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Carrie Barton on bass, Mm. Cam Davis on drums. Also Bonnie Johnson on drums. And Bernice Brooks. Bernice Brooks, yes. She played on uh, uh, our version of 9 to 5, Working Woman, I think it was, or something like that. And working in that studio was a dream. It was kind of dialed in already with L.A. Jones as the engineer. Well, and now that you mention all these things, I think the hallmark of that album, which I think is an eternal listening joy. I mean, there's nothing about Fire in the Rain that sounds dated to me when I listen to it now 30 years later, Mm -hmm. more than 30 years later. But as you're bringing up these recollections, I realize that We were girls, right? We were women. And I'm not sure that anyone expected the level of professionalism, the level of rigor, the amount of preparation, the insistence on the detail, right? Mm -hmm. This was not a novelty thing. This was a bunch of seriously 
committed musicians, committed to the music, committed to the project, committed to the quality of the recording and the music, and committed to doing something that we might not have been expected to do. Yeah. But we were really there about the music and making the finest recording of music possible. Yeah, we were serious, serious as heck. Yeah. And it was a joy, actually, being that committed and that focused to have the goal of doing the best that we absolutely could and having the tools to do that. So we've known each other, let's say that was 1980. You're confirming that to me. That was the same year that I did the... I did an initiation, a Buddhist initiation up on Mead Mountain, and the next day I met John Lennon in New York. I actually went to a gig. Did you play that gig in New York? Which one? It was at the bottom line, because I had never actually seen yeah. or heard Holly live, which was kind of, you know, it was important that I heard her live. It must have helped, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and during the sound check, I got a phone call, and it was Lee's dad, Lee, whom you just recorded with. Earl Slick, he was playing on Double Fantasy. Mm. And he said, you know, John Lennon wants to meet you. I said, yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, he said, come on down to Mr. Chow's. Mm. And I did. So that was an important slice of time for me. And before we recorded, after we did pre-production, but before we recorded, I had like a week or two off. We all took that time off. And I went down to Baja, California to go hook up with uh, Diane and Nyad and one of her best friends, and we stayed in this little house, and that is where I wrote. I'm just mentioning this all because that's a kind of a golden time for me. I wrote Rosarita mm. down there, so it's all of a piece. Mm -hmm. You know, that period of time for me is like in amber. It's golden. It's And then Lennon was shot while we were mixing, and that was right. that was a real shock, and that changed, I think, all our lives. Yeah. You know. Uh, but let's continue. So you were already accomplished. So music in you. We were talking about when the caissons go rolling <laughs> along today. You know that song, and it's kind of, what kind of a thread for you, musical? And for me, that song is important because I sang that in choir in the Philippines and sang it lustily. I love that song. But why don't you tell your story about it and your mom's, your birth mom and the search and all that kind of stuff? Because you... You have been on a trajectory ever since I met you. That song, The Caissons. Yeah. Over hill, over dale, dale as we hit the, the dusty dust trail. trail. <laughs> yeah, it's a catchy tune. Yeah. I, um, what I was explaining to you a little while ago is that I have music in my mind constantly. It never goes away. Yeah. Sometimes I'm actively engaged with it, and I'm actually interacting with it. Sometimes I'm just treading water there, and I need to fill the channel with something. And often what that channel fills with in those moments of stasis is that song. I was adopted at birth. I am absolutely positive that my adoptive family never played that song. <laughs> so over the years, as I thought about what would I ever ask my birth mother, were I fortunate enough to meet her, I realized I would ask her, what about that song, right? So jump ahead 63 years, oh. and I had the extraordinary and very happy good fortune of, of finding my birth mother and meeting her and um, getting into a comfortable relationship with her mm -hmm. um, that involved visiting her in South Carolina, visiting her in Atlanta, talking to her on the phone fairly regularly. Never asked her that question until one day I was driving to work and the song came in my head and I thought, oh, all I have to do is pick up the phone and call her, <laughs> which I did. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, Pat, you know that song, Over Hill, da, da. She said, well, of course I know that song. And then the big question, mm -hmm. did you listen to that song while you were pregnant with me? Beat. Why would I listen to that song? <laughs> That's a World War II, or is it World War I? Caissons are canon. <laughs> you know, yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is really about, it's about so many things. It's about the absolute joy in not having to wonder anymore. Mm -hmm. It's the ecstasy of reaching the end of a journey and letting go of the need to know and just letting it be. And in this case, mm -hmm. letting it be was, it has been and continues to be a source of real joy for me. How interesting that that's tied in with a military song that we both know. I mean, how 
random is that? It's it's random, <laughs> but then so was meeting you, mm-hmm. random, and here we are 40 years later, and we're sitting a few feet away from each other having a conversation. So is it only 40 years? I feel only? Like I'm <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But what what is your first recollection? Before we started recording today, you said something like being so lucky that the piano speaks directly through you. Is that what you said? I can say that I am absolutely my most natural self when I'm at the piano. Mm. That is where I am me. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a beautiful concept, right? And reality for you. It is, yeah. So when did it start to speak through you? When did you know? Or did you know right away? That's, I guess, what I'm getting at. Or was it a gradual, oh, yeah, this owns me? My mother, who raised me, had a lot to do with it. I had an older brother. We lived up the street from a piano teacher. And in those days, late 1950s, every good family that could provided their kids with ballet lessons or piano lessons. So all the kids on the street took piano lessons from Mrs. Siegel. And when my mother would bring my brother for his piano lessons, she would also bring me. Mm-hmm. One evening after his lesson, she noticed that I was humming the songs that he had been learning. And I don't know if it was a stroke of genius on her part or if any three-year-old kid that sat in her brother's piano lesson would just come home and hum the songs. What were the songs? Do you remember? Oh, you know the John Thompson, well, the John Thompson books. Could you hum it now? Um, Any of them? Da, 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 oh, da. Okay. That was down, up, up, down, oh. up, da, da, da. They were primary. They were really primary. And I don't know what else. But what I do know is that talk about a stroke of good fortune. When my mother asked Mrs. Siegel, would she consider taking on a three-and-a-half-year-old as a student, Mrs. Siegel agreed. She probably was just as specific as you were at the beginning of Fire in the Rain. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not just going to take anybody because it seems like a friendly thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where my deep respect for teachers comes from as well. Because Mrs. Siegel taught me not only how to play that instrument, the piano, but she taught me the language of music. She taught me music theory. She taught me what a scale was, what major and minor are, Mm -hmm. how these things relate to each other. I can remember the day when I was finally tall enough to stand up and press the pedal down and play the keys at the same time so I could play that song about the church bells and let them ring out. Everything about being at the piano was right and has always been right for me. I have to assume I came into the world with a gift for it, and I want to give tremendous credit to my mother for opening the door to what became probably the most important aspect of my life and to Mrs. Siegel for being willing to put up with a a three-and-a-half-year-old kid. So you were lucky. Very. Yeah. I also remember that you played a benefit concert at Hampshire College with me because I wanted to be next to Ann Hackler, who I'm still (laughs) next to, and you were very good about coming up and doing that and and going through all my... I I was insane in my everything, wanting to be next to her and the whole excitement, but it was you and Toshi Regan. And, you know, that evening is big for me. It's big that you were there. It's big that I asked you. And at the time, you were living with June Jordan in Brooklyn. And I know that Anne and I went down to hang out with you guys in Brooklyn. And then later, you brought June to IMA West right. in Bodega. We had a great time. We had several. <laughs> yes. We had several great times, you know, hanging out in the studio, hanging out at the kitchen table, talking about music. Boy, did she adore you. Yes, she did, and I adored her. Yeah. And I still do. Yeah, totally. Well, she's totally present today. Yeah. I know that. You know, people come down from the spheres here at IMA. This is why it's called the Magical Queendom, in part. Can you speak to that, to the feeling of recording here or walking in or your association? You're such a steadfast, nobody's going to turn you away from what we're doing here, from our mission. The world needs, I, with all my heart, I understand how much the world needs and loves what you and Anne and IMA are all about. Yeah. And in a very personal way, so do I. Mm-hmm. You know, I can say that here I am on this day, because it's the tail end of a two-month stay with my mother, my 93-year-old mother, Mm -hmm. that I flew out to Boston to be with her and to support her through this pandemic. 
This is the one and only day during these two months that I have left her house to do something anywhere else. And there was no question in my heart that this is where I would come to do this. IMA is a sanctuary, not only in a quiet way, not only in a way of safety, but for me, sanctuary in the sense that I get to walk into this place that is infused with your musical genius, your musical imprint on the world, and specifically on my life, with Anne's vision and partnership Mm -hmm. to make this thing have walls and windows and microphones and wires and buildings and food and life. All of this is here. And then a little while ago, you were looking through some files to pull up a song that I had recorded, and we couldn't even remember when it was. And it was 2014, it turns out. And I said, oh, right. I came up here and spent about a week. This is where I come. This is the place that I will come to. When you were at the Creamy and Bodega, that was the place that I would want to go to. And the Creamery was very special. Yeah, and this is it. Knowing that girls and young women are coming in here to launch themselves in music, in whatever way their heart takes them, to me lives in the air here. And I come to celebrate that, and I come because it feeds me. You know, when you use the word sanctuary, it makes me think of what churches have been through hundreds of years, that sanctuary where, in theory, you will not go to a church where people have gathered and murder those people, although it Mm. has happened. But in that way, I feel like IMA is a sanctuary in the church sense, in that sacred sense, because it's well-protected physically and maybe in the non-physical world, because I definitely, when I walk in, especially when I walk out at the end of the day, I thank everyone who stopped by. Mm -hmm. And there are quite a few spirits here. There were spirits who actually forced I'm going to say us, but I really mean me, because I did not want to move here. And you know I have a pretty big will. (laughs) I did not want to move to Goshen, Massachusetts, to this place with the steep staircases. You know, our staircase is an 1814 house. So the, the stairs that go upstairs, there's always a difference in the height so that the devil can't find his or her way upstairs. You know, that's an old, I guess it's not a myth because people definitely followed it. That's how they built their houses. I did not want to move here. But 25 acres in an 1814 house, 1816, excuse me, house with a huge barn that we were able to modify and tear down walls and build the bunkhouse for the girls, rock and roll girls camps and build two studios and we're still continuing to improve and et cetera. But I've had many people walk to the door of the barn, open the door and just stop and start to cry. If only this had been here when I was younger. But it's, you know, it's never too late. It's here now. And I kind of feel like, although the voices spoke to me and then I spoke to Anne and we got it going, (laughs) I kind of feel like, yeah, it's a lot of people call this place into being similar to how I felt about women's music through feminism. When I first went on my first tour with Chris Williamson in 76, and I'm sure that we've spoken of this before, I began to realize, what? This this is, I didn't want to go on the road with her because I didn't think it was going to be so exciting. And from day one, from the first concert, I realized, whoa, this is rock and roll. It's actually more than I experienced in rock and roll because, for one thing, I realized I wasn't so objectified. She was a star, so I could do what I did Tai Chi on stage, people. I mean, I played (laughs) drums. I, I totally got to be free and experiment. But I also realized in when we got off the road from that first tour, I realized, oh, that's what's happening. That's partly why I quit Fanny. I quit Fanny for an unknown to me. I was going towards something, but I didn't know what, I knew I was searching, I knew I wanted to grow up, and I knew I couldn't grow up in Hollywood in the milieu in which I was immersed, but I felt so grateful because I realized, ha, not only is it people coming, mostly women, but not entirely, coming, although the guys were kicked out in the first (laughs) six months of the year, okay, I I do admit, all right, (laughs) but I realized Oh, they're coming in from time immemorial. We all called this in together. It's 
way bigger than us. It was certainly bigger than me. And when I realized that, oh, I could then just do my huge out breath and fall into the magic and the mystery of it. That's why IMA is here. It is also celebrating that. It's celebrating that which we all called in together. And a lot of women and girls don't realize that they're being called, <laughs> they're being called here. And, uh, you know, we're doing virtual rock and roll girls camps this summer. So we're not going to mm. be, well, you and I are separated by glass right now. Every single interview I've done here so far has been, I can, well, I can see your eyes, but, you know, I could feel the breath. Yeah. But these, these are different times, you know. And so yeah. we're all living through them together, learning, molting, growing, expanding. I'm so glad you came today because so very few people come here now. They're not really allowed to. But when I got the email from you, you said, what do you think? I'm like, yeah, I think yes, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting when you're talking about the beginnings of IMA at the Creamery and Bodega. Um, one of the things that sticks in my mind was the way you introduced it to me which was very clearly, it is a performance space, but it is an institute. It is also a teaching and learning space. And everyone who comes to give a show also stays to teach. Mm -hmm. And then as you started talking about the early days of women's music, I realized that uh, I think what, you know, I can't say anything drew me to it because I really have just been walking around, you know, wandering. I, I wander, you know, and I happen upon some of the most magnificent opportunities, but I wandered into women's music. And there, of course, there was the outward experience of it. There were the shows, there was the traveling, there was, you know, the recording and all that kind of stuff. My experience of it, June, sitting at the bench as an accompanist, as a member of an ensemble, not as a headliner, not as a solo act, was very much like that precept, which was, we are here to learn, to pass on, and what I will forever carry with me about the years that I spent in women's music, with Holly recording, with Meg, with Chris, with Farron, um, is what I learned and the people in that setting that I hold as teachers. You are absolutely, you are my guru Maharajun. <laughs> Let's get real. Um, being on the road with Linda Tillery for a year, multi-instrumentalist, musically so thoughtful and articulate yeah. and communicative. Yeah. I think of times that she would stand behind me and put her hands on my shoulder and tap out a rhythm, right? I think about, um, certainly I think about the work in the studio with you, both on Fire in the Rain and on different projects up at IMA in, in the Creamery. I absolutely revere Mary Watkins and Kay Gardner, the two instrumentalists in that universe. I think about the fact that it wasn't only musicians, there were record distributors, there were engineers, Leslie Ann Jones. How many people did Leslie teach to become engineers? And how many of them are now engineering and teaching other people? Karen Kane. We were a community of, of women who came together for compelling reasons that we might each articulate in different ways. But I think one of the things that really held us together, part of the cohesion of that diverse community, had to do with the fact that we were learning and teaching. And that is, I think, a powerful glue as a culture, because that, is, that comes from a place of generosity and it comes from a place of honoring the processes mm -hmm. of teaching and learning. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, the times that we're in right now are so difficult. But I think about when I first got involved in women's music and I was dragged kicking and screaming into it. Yeah. I had to learn about all the pain that had gone on before. That's why we stood apart from the men. But I didn't quite understand the whole reason for it. And I had to listen to women's stories over and over again. It was the same story. I was abused. I was, you know. And I heard hundreds of them. And I began to understand, oh, yeah, so this is a process where, in fact, there were a lot of questions about why would we all get so mad about each other, but it was the safe place to do that, right? 
and to learn and to learn how to drop the outside world, so to speak. It's not a metaphor, but it is a metaphor. We were talking in the kitchen today and you said, you know, I realized I can just drop the whole thing. I don't have to hold on to all this. And my process of going into women's music and beginning to trust it had to involve that where I had to stop believing in what I thought I knew and start listening to people's experiences, truly listening, with a sort of a reverence for their experience. Like, I mean, I was not beat up and abused the way they were, but I had to hear that it actually happened to them and what were their reactions to it. And for us all, women's music was the place where we could take a breath. Mm. So valuable. I've had a lot of girls who've come to our girls' camps. I've heard both sides of the story. One is, even going further back, I wish that I, I wish I could have been there in the 60s. <laughs> and I'll give various responses to that. But also, I don't need feminism. I'm not a feminist. Oh, yeah, you are. You just don't know it yet. And I feel like that's how I went into it. I was actually a feminist. I was kicking and screaming. I was spitting at the world, turning up louder, learning how to really play. Yeah. But yeah, I was a feminist before knowing I was a feminist. And when I realized I had walked into this world that was absolutely opening up with hundreds of thousands of souls and spirits coming in, it was kind of mind-blowing. And I met you uh, just as I was really getting started in in that. I feel like we both recognize something, not only in each other, but in the commonalities of our experience. Interesting, because now that you're talking about it, I actually recall a kind of reticence on your part when we were doing Fire in the Rain, which was 1980. I'm Um, very wary, 80. Well, I think it came across, you know, it came across not in a, in not in a in a way that had any sort of bad impact on the project, but it was interesting to me because you were an outsider in a sense. I mean, you'd done Strange Paradise, which again is one of the greatest albums of all time, and I can put it on today and listen to it, and it sounds as fresh as it did 45 years ago, whatever that was. Um, But it was clear to me that you were in this project, you were on the road, you were doing the stuff with us, and you were standing in the doorway in some respects, right? And... At the time, I thought what you were signaling to us was, this is not just a let's get together and have fun. This is a serious professional project. And that is where we're going to meet each other, right? But it's interesting now, as you look back then, you're saying that the turning point for you was, was it hearing the stories? What was it for you? You know, I had such a hard time in the Philippines, partly because it was a war-torn country and I was the first girl born after World War II to my mother's family. My father was an outsider to the entire culture. And when he realized that, he communicated it to me. He was pretty angry about it. He didn't understand the Philippine culture, yet there he was married to a, a Filipina woman, he was having children, but he didn't understand it. So that outsider thing was kind of born with, was carried within me. And then we came to Sacramento when I was 13. Boy, howdy, talk about being an outsider. I didn't even know that, I didn't know that there was a different type of racism that was institutionalized racism here towards black people. And of course now it's extended to so many uh, different types of people. I mean, a type, you know. So... I was a total outsider, and I, I felt like since I didn't know what was going on, and plus I didn't know until I was 13, I was deaf in one ear, I didn't know until I was 25, I don't have equilibrium on the same side, I was completely outside the whole thing. But music brought me directly, wham, slam, right into the room with you, with everyone else. So yeah, I was standing at the door, but I was invited in by the entire vibe, by the seduction of music, the true and pure seduction of music. You know, I'm just, something just leaped into my head, so I'm going to share it with you. Um, I needed, (laughs) I needed Mary Watkins to write some string parts. And you know Mary, how's she? Wow, I don't know, I don't know. 
don't really have very much time, but okay. So I met her at a laundromat. I had a tape of Fire in the Rain and a couple of other songs, so I'm playing it for her. She takes, I don't know, she got a piece of paper and she starts scribbling on the washer. And I said, how can you do that? She says, well, you know, she, she has synesthesia, so she sees notes and keys and colors. And she can access whatever she hears and write it right down. So that was the first time I realized, wow, you can really do that. I mean, you talk about adoring Mary. We became very good friends when I produced her first album. And the break, huh? Wow! <laughs> that whole experience with Gwen Avery and everything. I was introduced to a different world of which I was a part, but of which I always had to stand apart. That's breaking down a little bit now, but I was laughing with you earlier today about quarantine. I feel like I've been in quarantine all my life. Yeah, I've been in my own little room. I actually don't miss the world. What's going on right now, I realize, is tremendously difficult uh, for everybody, but I don't feel like really my life has changed because I don't... Uh, I, I pretty much can fill my, t- <laughs> my time up by jumping into the spheres by listening. If I just quiet down, I hear all sorts of stuff. I don't really need a whole lot of chatter and conversation and to find out who you're with and who hurt your feelings and what you're eating and your latest noom and all that kind of stuff. I decided to let go of that a long time ago. You know, when I realized, actually in the 70s, I was doing yoga every day in, in Fanny, and I realized I was just stressing myself out about, did I do yoga today or not, right? Somewhere around 78 or something. And I just decided, well, you know, I'm not going to bother with that. I'm not going to worry about that. So I don't worry about the color of my hair um, really so much what I'm eating, except I listen to my body. You know, stuff like that. Do you get what I'm saying? It's like I'm in it, but not of it. I'm a hoverer. And I put in the best effort I can to actually appear like I'm actually here so as not to frighten people. <laughs> But in a lot of ways, I have an avatar who is right, who is pushed out in front of me to make people feel better because they know I'm different. How many times have I been told I'm weird? Which I take personally because I feel like, well, what, what is it you don't understand about me? I don't need to tell you everything. You don't need to tell me everything. Let's get down to, you know, the music or whatever. It's a different way of, so. I think that's it. And the question that I want to ask you is this. You and Anne are partners in the world. The, there's, I mean, it's an absolutely beautiful and lucky for the rest of us partnership. That said, do you ever feel that music is your perfect companion? I would say yes. I would say yes. Yeah. Me too. And I think that might be why some of us or many of us um, find it a little easier to go through a time like this when we have to distance from a more active set of social engagements because in some ways all it's doing is freeing up more time for us to be with our perfect companion and so and, you know and I hope I'm not overstating that I, I think you nailed it actually because as you said that I'm realizing that is really true I I don't want to waste my time with I don't know I, Sort of the niceties of too much thought, too much involvement. You can't get yourself out of this situation, that situation, that subterfuge. You lied at some point in the journey, and now you're trying to unlie, or you know, you know what I'm saying. It's like the complications of life are endless. And when I got to Buddhism in my early 30s, and and I finally got together with Anne, I was 36, and I. Had well, I was peeking on the teachings from Ruth Dennison, for example. I already studied with the Dalai Lama. In fact, that's how we got together, was following the Dalai Lama as a groupie, essentially. I was getting the teachings. But I was so happy to learn about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, the fact that you start from suffering, because I was suffering so much I couldn't understand it. And then I realized, oh, you just accept that it starts with suffering. I, I'm getting off on a, t- a tangent here, but I'm looking right in your eyes. You accept that it's suffering and everything starts to unwind from there. It starts to unravel the nature of, uh, of the truth, I'm going to say the truth, just starts to reveal itself. 
you know, you realize that we actually are all in luminosity. And I think I think I always rested in that piece of it, knowing that I don't really need to talk to you so much. We all come from luminosity. Don't you know that? I mean, can we just like sit with each other and uh, yeah. be a little bit more silent, be quiet, like uh, feel each other, feel each other's thoughts. I don't know. I just don't feel the need. I don't feel the need to engage in so much conversation unless it's really compelling. Because you know what? It's all the same story. It's all the same details. It really is. Yeah. I am not a student of Buddhism. My beloved partner, Kanda Mason, is. And I think an accidental teacher in that Mm -hmm. because we move through life together and because um, I enjoy learning. I have learned and certainly learned to appreciate some of the tenets of Buddhism. And I'm bringing this up because that, along with finding my birth mother after a 37-year search, put me in a place of having to completely redefine my relationship to music. I realized that up until then, not the playing of other people's music, but the music that I was writing was very much coming from a place of yearning and sadness. And that was all about searching for my birth mother, right? Lo and behold, I found her. It's been a happy story. I am learning through Kanda, through other friends who are students and teachers of Buddhism, about the real joy Mm -hmm. of stepping away from pain instead of engaging in it. And I went through a period of real uncertainty about whether or not I would still have a relationship to music. Interesting. Because its purpose Mm. had to fundamentally change. It was a bomb, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I'm there. Only this year have I started writing music again. And I have to find a very different place Mm -hmm. in myself Mm -hmm. for inspiration. And As we all know, writing music, performing music, is not simply, oh, if the spirit hits you in the right way, it's going to be good. There is discipline, there's learning, there's applying experience and what we've learned from other stuff. So I have all of those tools ready to use to say something differently than I've ever said it before. And again, being able to come up here and just be me, play, for you and Lee to record it so I can come and join you in the room and listen to it and get back into that process is such a huge gift. I can't tell you how much I love you for this. And interestingly, I figured out while we were standing in the kitchen that the show I referenced at Hampshire was under a month before Lee was born. (laughs) How connected are we, Adrian Torf? Yeah, now. Like this. Like so this. yeah, let's talk about your your music. It's been a while since you've released an album, isn't that right? It has. When was the last time you released music? Well, I've only had three. Okay. Four, if you count. What I had Brooklyn from the Roof, which I wrote when mm-hmm. I was living in Brooklyn and writing. I was living with June and living with someone who saw me as a composer. <laughs> June Jordan... I yeah. adored you. Let me just yeah. say that clearly. Yeah. It's my good fortune. Yeah. Um, you know, and to be in that environment, I wrote and wrote and wrote, and I was in New York, and the friction of everyday life, that good kind of friction, that like constant testing, like what's your response to this? How are you going to get through that? You know, all of that is, I thought, so incredibly energizing as a creative soul, right? Constant feeding of that creative energy. So I wrote all this music. I came back out to San Francisco. So when you say, I wrote all this music, can you speak to any impetus for it other than what you just said? Is there more? I'm just wanting to dig just a little bit deeper. Well, yeah, June and I got together because she... uh, I was on the road with Linda. We were on a double bill with Diane Lindsay and Meg Christian in Minneapolis. Arlana Vaughn produced a concert, a double bill. Right At the time, June was a visiting poet, visiting professor at McAllister College, and Arlana had the wisdom to invite June to come and open that evening's performance with a reading of some of her poetry. Then June heard the show, and Arlana said to me, June Jordan would like to meet you. So I went back to her room. 
I won't go into great detail, but it ended up with her basically saying, how about, would you like to collaborate? And I said, sure. So we started writing together and sending things. She was living in Brooklyn, I was living in Oakland. And we would, in those days, send things on paper, send things on analog cassettes, back and forth. She would write something, send it to me. I would put music to it, record it, send it to her. We'd get on the phone. I'd fly to New York sometimes. And then after a year of that, I moved to New York. So our whole relationship was about creative collaboration and love. So I was writing stuff with June. We wrote a full-length stage musical called Bang Bang Uber Alice. And my whole purpose when I woke up every day was to write music. So I also wrote the music that ended up on Brooklyn from the Roof. That was, I think, 1985. I didn't actually make another solo album until the last year of June's life when we decided to record some of the pieces that she and I had written. So we did. We recorded collaboration. Some of the performances on collaboration are June and myself. Some of them include other musicians. I was mentioning Rhiannon sang on it. Chris sang on it. Chris Williamson. Um, Andre Dos Santos Morgan was on a couple mm, of pieces. Yeah. Andre had That's been right, in Bang Bang Uber Alice. Yeah, I think you introduced us to yeah, him. Yes, Andre's incredible. Andre's my brother. Yeah. Collaboration was recorded in 2001. June passed away in 2002. And after that, I wrote the music that was then recorded again with Leslie Ann Jones as two hands open, solo piano, no synthesizers. I was just trying to put the pieces together and figure out what was left. Mm -hmm. And clearly what was left, aside from loving friends and family, but what was left of me was piano. <laughs> um, and I did not record since then. I went off and started working as a nonprofit CFO. And, and now I'm getting back to music. So when you, I'm just going to use this word as a holding place, left music. Yeah. What did that feel like? Uh, a betrayal. Mm -hmm. An absolute betrayal of loving myself for who I am. Okay. Now we're getting down to it. Yeah. And so what were the breadcrumbs that led you back to the gingerbread house? You know. Truth. Okay. Truth. And, you know, getting caught up in, I was never in one of those high-paying banking jobs, you know, investment bankers and stuff like that. It wasn't so much about the money. In a way, it goes back to something we were talking about a little while ago. Living on the outskirts. I mean, let's face it. Except for when we're hanging out with other musicians and creative people, we do live somewhat on the margins. In a bubble? In this economy, right? We are, yes. in some way, we are not seen mm -hmm. as fully legitimate, right? So right. We work, we earn money. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're doing all the things that other people do, yeah. but the context in which we do it is seen somehow as less central, yeah. right? To so right, yeah. the, the beat of life in this country. I was absolutely fascinated to find that my first job out of business school had me doing something that I was completely clueless at. I was getting paid more than I had ever been paid as a musician. And when I told people what I did, they responded with a look of, of sort of respect. Oh, oh, that's a good, that's... You have a real job. Exactly. Yes. After a couple of decades, that's worn off. <laughs> and I think that... Uh, so many things in life have led me to understand that if we're not using the time that we have here and now to be who we are and to bring to the world the people we love, strangers and ourselves, the best that we can bring, the truest of ourselves, then we're squandering something absolutely precious. And... Fortunately, I've lived long enough to get tapped on the forehead with that bit of wisdom. And that wisdom simply is, we are not here infinitely. We are here now. Mm -hmm. And what is the truest way to spend this moment? I'm not saying I do it all the time, but I'm saying I am strongly drawn back to that. And I want to do more and more of it. I love it. I know you're going to be back. Oh, I'm so glad that we got on to yeah. that because that's a really important piece that you were led to that so-called betrayal. And 
I think that is part of your search for your birth mother, right? I remember when you found her, you called us immediately, or it seemed to me immediately, but you were led to a truth of your existence, Mm -hmm. and it must have opened up so much more for you. It was freeing, because what I learned, Jude, was that it is not in anybody else. (sighs) Yes. Right? That what I thought all those decades, all those years, and all that searching, what I thought I would find in somebody else actually turned out to be me. Let's say that again. (laughs) (laughs) It's not in anybody else. Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's the central piece, isn't it? You can put flowers in it, put it in the middle of the dining table, (laughs) eat around it. Sometimes you see, sometimes you don't. But that is the centerpiece. It is not in anyone else. Wow. I love hearing that. Uh, It feels pretty good to say it. And it's new. It's still new. How old are you, 80? Do you mind my asking? I don't mind you asking at all. I was 65 last week. (laughs) So young! (laughs) Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, it's great having this conversation with you. Um, Are there any questions you want to ask me? I do. I have lots of questions. Fire away, darling. How are you? How are you in this time in your life? I feel feel freed up, quite frankly. And I feel freed up enough to continue to search for ways to keep being free. There's always another way in which you can relax into what is. Ruth Dennison used to say to me, June, life as it is, not as you want it to be, you know? She'd point up at a cloud in the sky. Do you realize that's a cloud and not your idea of a cloud? She was trying to give me all these clues, you know? I would hear and I go, oh my God, I gotta remember that, you know, (laughs) write down that truth or whatever. But they started to really live inside me. And I I played you my song, The World, The Sky, that was, uh, I described as a birthday present from the universe to me. I look at the world, now it looks back at me. What does that mean exactly? Well, there's the koan, isn't it? I look at the world, it looks back at me. I live long enough to feel the world looking back at me, and that has to do with how I carry myself, responsibility, right? I have to let go, really, of pride. You know, it's not, I, I, I'm proud of what I have accomplished. But just stuff that kind of holds you back, I, as soon as I realize that it's there, I try to let go of it because it's not useful to me and to anyone else is, is, would be more to the point. You know, you were asking me earlier, um, I forget what the question was, but I was on the way to say to you that it was not until my mid-20s, okay, listen to this, this is big, okay. that I realized other people had feelings. I think I was with Chris. I was doing something with her, and she got really mad at me for something. I forget what. You know, she was allowed to do that. She's one of the few people who could really, you know, have at it. And I would take it, and I would listen. I would learn, you know, and it worked the other way as well. But, um, uh, you know, somebody, I, all of a sudden I just stopped, and I'm like, my God, she's got feelings just like I do. That's how protected protective I was of my little space in which I was huddled. And there's a a story, a metaphor in the Buddhist studies in which it is said that when you die, you know, you go through that middle period or that beginning to middle period, and then you see a little space like a little hole in the hillside, and you go to it and you cuddle inside of it to be safe. Boom. That's the second you're in the womb. Mm. So... Imagine that. And I, because I was so confused, gosh, I remember I was truly frightened. There was something I needed to know, and I didn't know what it was. Here I was in the Philippine culture. My dad was American. It was all, I was half hearing, half not, half in balance, half not, half Filipino, half not, half white, half not. It was, um, I found that to be truly frightening because I had no one to whom I could even articulate my uneasiness. I'm really nervous. What? Uh, Nobody I could ask. Nobody ever asked me how I felt. So I kept that all in. And in order to survive to the point that I could realize that other people had feelings, I mean, 
It's not that I did. I mean, it's not that I didn't know. Like, I feel like Jean was the closest person to me. But we almost, we almost experienced things as one being. We didn't really need to talk that much. So how do I come out of that? How do I come out of that to realize you have feelings, you have your experience. And that's why I love doing these conversations, because I can find out something that's outside of me. And I'm continually learning that, and it is absolutely fascinating. You're also a marvelous storyteller. I guess I, guess I am. We're, we're getting a signal that we should go yeah. have dinner. Let me just mention, yeah, you're right. I hope what we're going to mention is the first part of your memoir. Mm. Mm-hmm. which is everybody who hears this, get mm. your hands on one, mm, thank go you. away for a week, and live that, live that book, live the story. You are a mm. fabulous storyteller. Yeah, and I'm doing part two now, and I'm turning one into an audio book. Well, let me just mention, since you did, yeah. how the only place you can get Land of a Thousand Bridges is through IMA. Okay. IMA.org. Go under the Help Out tab. And there you'll see merchandise, and it's under merchandise. But, you know, it took me 20 years to write that book. Seriously? Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. I had, it was totally frightening to even consider doing it, you know, but somebody had to do it. Somebody had to tell the truth or a truth from the inside. I'm constantly asked this question. How did you do it? How did you do Fanny? How did you create all that music? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, honestly, we started from a place, a safe place that we found together. Mm-hmm. First, me and Jean, we found a safe place where we could just, we didn't need to talk too much, we just knew it was safe, you know. And then we found it with some other girls, we started a band and so on. So I feel like, even though I feel like I've had such a hard life, really, it's been enchanted. When you think of all, I met you, I, I, how I, Chris and I met each other, uh, how I met John Lennon, how we recorded at Apple, how everything, how everything happened. So much so that I had to stop the first book, you know, in 1975, and now I'm starting, I think I'm on chapter eight or something, I'm just on my first tour in women's music mm. with Chris, you know, so, wow. How rock and roll crossed over with feminism and women's music was... Um, I have to say it entranced me then, and it entrances me now, and I love telling this story. So I guess we can leave it at that. We have so much more to talk about. So the next time you come to reveal your music with us, we'll talk some more. I can't wait. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Love you, Adrian. I love you, too. Okay. My guru. (laughs) Bye. Bye for now.